Today is the last day of this course, and this is our second talk. We hope that in the that during this course you have achieved two things: <clears throat> that you have understood the Dhamma more more deeply, and that you have met some success in practicing mental development. We need to have both of these things together. First of all, we need to have knowledge about the Dhamma, knowledge about how to make the mind peaceful. But still, we won't be able to actually do it, actually make the mind peaceful. And so we also need to have some understanding about how to practice in order to actually make the mind peaceful. You can't have just one without the other. In order to be successful in our endeavor, we must have both of these aspects together. Please be able to distinguish between these two, these two topics or subjects. We need to have each of them and understand them clearly. The first one is to understand the basic facts of nature, to understand the Four Noble Truths, to understand the law of nature, itapajayata, or conditionality, to understand dependent origination, to understand impermanence, oppressiveness, non-selfhood, voidness, thusness, and so on. We need to have this understanding about the way things actually are. But then, to go with that, we must also have some practical knowledge about how to use mindfulness with breathing in order to actually bring about the direct realization and, and living in accordance with those fundamental truths. If we don't have both of these aspects or topics working together, then it probably won't be possible for us to meet with any genuine success. We'd like you to look and look at the current situation and see that the Dhamma is something necessary when the industrial age has achieved its its highest level of development. When, when this, all this material, industrial, technological progress has occurred, we need the Dhamma in order to control that, in order to keep it within healthy limits and not let it get out of bounds. But if without the Dhamma, then things run, run wild and create all sorts of problems as we're seeing today. If you examine this just a little bit, you can easily see that Dhamma is absolutely necessary when we have achieved such a high level of industrial and technological development. Let's look at the, the phrase the highest development of the industrial age. This word industrial or industry refers to various tools, mechanisms, and so on that, that supply us with what we want and that make life easier, make life more comfortable. So this industry has supplied us with more and more tools to provide us with the objects of our desire in increasing numbers and to give us more and more comfortable lives where we can do things in incredibly easy ways, especially when compared with the past. For example, now every house has to have a washing machine which can do the work of dozens of people in one day. One washing machine can wash the same amount of clothes as many people. 
or we have vacuum cleaners which can do the work of a, a whole lot of people. In this way, we've made our life easier and more comfortable, not only just supplying our wants, but just enable just things that that support our daily existence. These have become more and more easy. And now with all this advance and progress and everything becoming so easy and comfortable where we have all kinds of money and we can buy all kinds of things and travel all around the world on, on our whims, what, what is the result of this? Does it result in peace, peace of mind and heart, or does it result in hell? <coughs> Take a look at this, this fact. In the old days, before the industrial age, people were killing each other in great numbers. Now, at this highest development of the industrial age, people are killing themselves in great numbers. Take a look at this fact, it's, <coughs> it's of great importance. If we look now that we have more and more things which fulfill our desires, please, please take careful note of this word, things that fulfill our desires. The more we have such things which respond to and satisfy our desires, then see what happens. Our desires increase. Our craving, our thirst, our hunger increases. The amount of our, our thinking, our worrying, our planning, all these things increase. And when with all this thinking and worrying and wondering and planning, then it's like we're, we're carrying a whole lot more things around in our minds. It's like we're carrying, we start picking up and carrying around very heavy burdens. And this means we have more and more attachments which are weighing down our lives. And the more of these attachments we have, the more, the more troubles and problems and pain and misery we have in our lives. Can you, can you see the direct correlation between the increase in things fulfilling our desires and the increase in our difficulties, our problems, our conflicts, our traumas. The more there are these things which satisfy our wants, the more we, we, we can't find peace, we can't sleep at night, we can't relax, we can't even smile, a, a real smile anymore. So the more we have these things that fulfill our desires, then the, the more troubles we have, the more problems we have. This is because we have more and more of these things. It ought to be obvious that instead of having more things to fulfill our desires, what we need is just to have what is sufficient or adequate. But then we we have the difficulty that we don't, we don't know. We don't know how much is enough. We don't know what to want. What, what wants are sufficient and what wants and desires are, are excessive or luxurious or ridiculous. We don't, we don't understand this. And so when we don't know where to draw the line between enough and too much, then our, our desires always are too much excessive and luxurious. These desires have, have no limit. They increase on and on and on as long as we don't understand, don't have the right kind of knowledge to know what is enough. This again shows the importance of Dhamma. If we have an understanding of Dhamma, this will help us to know what is enough and what is too much. And then we can control our wants so that we only want what is proper and enough. And then we 
we can get free of all these excessive, crazy, ridiculous wants that are causing us so many problems. This is how Dhamma can help us. Now, if we look at our friends, we'll easily see that they've got way too many things. If we look at the people around us, it's quite obvious that they have more than they need, that their wants and their the things satisfying those wants are excessive and too much. But then if we look at ourselves, we'll never see it this way. When we look at ourselves, we never see that our own wants and our own possessions are excessive and too much. So don't, don't bother looking at your friends. Instead, learn to look at yourself and learn to do so honestly and see and see whether your wants are sufficient or, or excessive. It's because of what we call avicca or ignorance, not knowing that we're unable to see what's enough. As long as we look at ourselves with ignorance, then we won't, we won't be able to tell the difference between sufficiency and luxury and excess. So we need to sweep away, get rid of that ignorance in order to be able to look at ourselves clearly and then see what wants are wise and which wants are foolish and ignorant. So it's necessary to get rid of that, that ignorance. Ignorance leads to, to foolish desire. Note the adjective foolish. Ignorance leads to this blind, foolish, stupid want and desire. But when we want in a correct way, when there is the desire of wisdom, then there's not this problem of excess and luxury. So it's, it's not just, don't get hung up on the word desire or want, but the, the important thing is, is it a, a foolish want coming from ignorance, or is it a wise want which is correct? If this want is coming from ignorance, then it will always lead to excess, to luxury, and there will be no end to it. It will go on forever and will be perpetually hungry. An important phrase is knowing things as they really are, knowing things as they truly are in nature. This is a very important phrase because most of what we know doesn't really have much to do with the way things really are, such as all the things we go and learn in university. In university, we learn to be very clever and intelligent. We can think all kinds of incredible things, cite all kinds of marvelous statistics, but very little, if any of that, is, has anything to do with the way things really are. We go and amass a lot of cleverness and knowledge so that we can get jobs and so that we can argue and do things like that. But in university, we're never learning the way things really are. So in this way, we, we don't have the kind of understanding which prevents ignorant desire. In fact, all that university learning just leads to more and more foolish desires as we can see all around us. And so, please give special importance to understanding the way things are, the way things are are naturally, the natural truth of things. And if you, more you understand this, the more you'll see that this is never taught in university. Dhamma is to know correctly according to the way things really are in nature. In this Dhamma is to understand everything as as they actually are in nature. In this word Dhamma, there are included, there are gathered many, many meanings. 
For example, God is included within the word Dhamma. We don't need to have some kind of God who we, we bow to and pray to and, and plead to give us this and give us that. We don't need that kind of God. But in the word Dhamma, there is the kind of God that is part of knowing how things really are in nature. And by understanding this Dhamma, we don't have to, we don't have to plead and beg and ask for help. This is the kind of Dhamma, the kind of knowledge we need, knowing things as they actually are in nature. To know Dhamma is to know how these things really are in nature. To know how they really are is to have the highest kind of understanding. And in this highest understanding of the reality of things, we also must know this also includes how to act regarding things. Just an abstract knowledge about things would be worthless. For it really to be not Dhamma, to really know how things are, we have to know how to act regarding them. We have to know how to speak, how to act, how to think, so that things are correctly. If we have this kind of highest Dhamma knowledge, then there won't be any problems. When we know how to act and speak and think, there won't be any difficulties anymore. If you'd like to translate the word Dhamma into an ordinary word that is familiar to us all, we can translate Dhamma as duty. Now some of you may think this is too ordinary a word, a word and you may not be interested. There's nothing special or fancy or exciting about the word duty. And so many fools aren't at all interested in this. But this word duty is the, the highest, the best translation of the word Dhamma. This is the highest kind of knowledge we need to know our duty. If we understand what duty is, what Dhamma is, then we always know how to act, what to do, what to say, and what to think. And when we're always acting correctly in accordance with nature, then there are no difficulties, no friction, no stress, no misery. If we don't do our duty, if we have no interest in this word duty, consider it unimportant or boring or something like that, if we overlook it, then we, we get into all kinds of problems. In fact, if we don't do our duty, we will die. <coughs> Physically, we will die. And spiritually, we will suffer. We'll be plunged in misery every time we fail to do our duty. So this word duty is the, the has the highest meaning. This is what Dhamma is about just this word duty. We'll go so far as to say that in the word duty we have all the meanings of God. Duty is God the, or God the creator is merely duty. God the preserver is also duty. And God the destroyer is duty. And Everything that is created is created through duty and maintained, preserved through duty and in the end destroyed through duty. Just this one word duty encompasses all, all the meanings of God. We don't have to look for God anywhere else but in the word, the word duty. This is the pinnacle of God, just this word duty. This word duty is life. If you look carefully, you'll see that life is just duty. If as soon as we stop doing our duty, there is death. You can look all around and at all levels of life and see that life is just duty. In this body, there are all these sacks. If a cell stops doing its duty, it dies. If all ourselves stop doing their duties, then we die. 
There are these various organs and systems within the body. If these stop doing their duties, then, then there is death. There's the respiration system, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the lymphatic system, the digestive system. If any of these stop functioning, if any of these duties are ceased, ceased to be done, then we die. It's like this for people. It's like this for animals. It's like this even for trees. In all living things, there is duty. And as soon as the duty is not done, there is death. The plants are doing their duty, are doing duty every second of the day. All through the day and all through the night, the plants are doing their duty. If you go and study botany, you'll, you'll understand this easily. Although the duties may differ from day to night, the duties are being constantly done without any let up, without any pause. All the duties are being done. If a plant if the plants stop doing the duties, then the plants will die. It's the same with animals. The survival of, of animals depends on their duties being done. If any of the duties stop, then there is death. Without duty, there is, there is no survival. And it's the same with human beings. All life is dependent on duty. If these duties aren't performed, we die. We survive only through duty. Duty is, is survival itself. We can't live without it. In English, you call this duty. In ancient days in India, they called it Dhamma. And here in Thailand, it's called Nati. But whatever it's called in whatever time or place or language, it's exactly the same thing. This thing that is absolutely necessary for life, this thing that we must understand and then practice as fully as we can. Way back in ancient times, in the, the early days of our race, maybe sometime just, the, just past the, the Stone Age, our, our primitive ancestors discovered this thing we now call duty, or Dhamma. They found out that if this isn't done, that, they, that there would be death. So they discovered this thing called duty. Then after it was discovered, this, was, this information, this knowledge was passed on from those who discovered it to their friends and relatives, and the word spread, and then was passed on from generation to generation. So the word duty was discovered and then began to circulate around among mankind so that we would know the secret of survival. This occurred long before the Buddha's time. But then when the Buddha appeared in the world, the Buddha discovered the highest duty, which is the utter quenching of dukkha. And then through discovering and then teaching this highest duty, we have all, are all given the potential to realize this duty, which is the ultimate of, the, or the highest level, the most complete, the perfection of survival. You can see for yourself without having to believe anyone that this word duty means that which must be done. Duty means that which must be done. If it's not done, we die. It's just absolutely necessary to do this. This is the meaning of duty, that which must be done, that which must be done. And so this is the Dhamma, the duty, that we need to understand. To saying that which must be done, this means actually knowing it, correctly understanding that which must be done and then actually doing it, correctly doing that which must be done. This is the meaning of duty, that which must be done. This is the, the highest meaning of duty, which you can know for yourself, that which must be done.
So duty dhamma means that which must be done. And you ought to understand that this means, first of all, to know. That which must be done must be known, must be understood. Once it is understood, it must be done. You have to do it. You can't just sit on your butts. You've got to, you've got to do it. And then when it's done, we've got it. We have it. And once we have it, then we use it. It must be understood and then done and then we have it and then we use it and the more we use it, the more we've got it. This is what, this is all included in that which must be done. To know it, do it, have it and use it. This This thing that must be known, done, had, and used is called duty. But we must be very careful to limit this to correct duty. It all must be correct. If this knowing, doing, having, and using isn't correct, then it's worthless. It doesn't do us any good. It's meaningless. It must be correct. It must be proper. And so what does it mean to be correct or proper? Please don't go off on some philosophical tangent or off speculating or in some logical argument. That won't give us an answer we can use. We'll have to rely on Dhamma. And in, and in terms of Dhamma, correct means that which quenches Dukkha. It's correct if it quenches Dukkha, if it extinguishes suffering. If it puts out misery, then it's correct. Any philosophical or theoretical arguments are meaningless. All that matters is the practical result which you can experience right here for yourself, that it eliminates suffering, it quenches dukkha. Then it's correct. If the duty is correct, then it will solve all our problems. If it's incorrect, it's not worth a prayer. If you've heard about, studied about, and begun to understand the thing we call the Noble Eightfold Path, then you'll have a clear understanding of what this correct duty is. In the Noble Eightfold Path are all the necessary elements of correct duty. These eight factors help us point out what what it takes to quench dukkha, to eliminate suffering. So, to learn about this Noble Eightfold Path is very valuable because it will show us what the correct duty is. Within this Noble Eightfold Path is all we need to know about duty. This Noble Eightfold Path includes mental development or what some people call meditation. That's included within there. And all the other aspects of life we need in order to fulfill our duty. So one should pay very careful attention to and properly study the Noble Eightfold Path. And then if one has this correct understanding, one will be able to use it in order to do the duty correctly. And then our life will be free of suffering. The first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is right understanding, right belief, right opinion, right right viewpoint, sure. right belief, <laughs> right faith, all of these things, right trust, right confidence, all of these make up the first factor, samaditi, or, or right view. This is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. And there is the second factor, which is right want, right, we could even say right desire, wanting things, intending things correctly. This is the second factor which we call sama sankapa or right aspiration. These are the first two factors of the, the middle way. Then the second group of factors has the three elements of right speech, correct speech, correct action, correct activity and work. And the third is correct livelihood, the maintaining one's life properly. These three factors make up the second group. And then the last of the three groups are the three factors of 
of right effort, right endeavor, right perseverance, right commitment, right determination. All these together make up right, right effort. And then there's right mindfulness, right sati, samasati, as you're practicing now, right mindfulness. And then there will be right samadhi, or right concentration, a mind that is firmly established, properly established, that is very stable and calm. All these together make up, there are these eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And individually, they're not yet correct. But when all eight of them come together, then they're truly correct. And this is the, the fullest meaning of duty, of correct duty. So the Noble Eightfold Path are these eight conditions of correct duty. These eight aspects of correct duty together make up the path, the path that we must travel along, that we must follow in order to fulfill our duty correctly. So to understand these eight factors of correctness, these eight, these eight aspects of correct duty will enable us to understand the word duty in the highest, the highest sense. In order to do this duty correctly, we, we have to act correctly. Our actions of body, speech, and mind must be correct. But if we're not careful, defilement, greed, anger, delusion, and so on, come in, and we're not able to act correctly. So then it's to prevent these things from taking over our bodies and minds. We have to control our bodies and minds. We have to make them. We have to restrain them and make them, sometimes even force them to do what is right. Self-restraint and self-control is absolutely necessary if we are going to act correctly. And if we don't act correctly, we can never do our duty. This system of anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, which we're we're talking about here, which you've been practicing for the last 10 days, this, exactly this system will enable you to understand. You'll understand what you need to know. And then it will enable you to train yourself to be able to actually do what you have to do. Through just this one system of anapanasati, you'll know what you need to know and you'll be able to make yourself do it. You'll be able to control this mind so that you can actually act correctly and do the duty. And when we know correctly and act correctly, then we're safe. Just through this anapanasati, which you've been learning. If we don't, if we don't do this duty correctly, even a hundred gods won't be able to help us. Excuse us for saying this, we're not trying to put down anyone's belief. But if we don't do our duty correctly, not even a hundred gods can help us. We've already heard that God only helps those who help themselves. This, we all know that if we don't go and do the duty correctly, the gods can't even help us. So it comes down to, we have to do this duty. If doing the duty is what helps us. Doing the duty is what saves us. So by doing the duty, we help ourselves, we save ourselves. It doesn't matter, and the gods can't help us, or God can't help us, or whatever, unless we go and do this duty correctly. Once duty is done correctly, then that correct duty becomes God. This duty, as soon as it's correct, it helps us. And then there is the fullest meaning of God. Correct duty becomes, becomes God. For this reason, in Buddhism, we hold that Dhamma, or duty, is, is God. 
So by doing this duty correctly, then we will have the God that can truly, truly help us. This duty that is correct is our helper. This is what helps us. And so, because we do the duty ourselves, we're our own helper. We help ourselves. In all of the Buddhist scriptures, you can't find one instance where the Buddha said that we should rely on anyone else. There's not one place where the Buddha says we should even rely on the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha. The Buddha never said anything like that. The Buddha only taught that we should rely on ourselves, depend on ourselves, help ourselves. All this stuff about people going to the Buddha for refuge, the Dhamma for refuge, the Sangha for refuge, all these ideas about depending on the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, this is something we've made up for ourselves. The Buddha never said anything like that. The Buddha said, help yourself, rely on yourself by doing this duty, by doing Dhamma. The only thing we can rely on is this duty, our own by doing this duty ourselves. This is what, what the Buddha taught. He never said anything about going to anyone else for refuge or for help. The Buddha spoke in, in Pali, but we'll translate it in English. And he said, you ought to rely on yourself. Don't rely on anything else. You ought to rely on Dhamma. Don't rely on anything else. Relying on ourself, relying on Dhamma, means relying on duty, on doing our duty. This is what we can depend on. This means, this includes practicing, or through practicing anapanasati, then we, <coughs> we can, we have the four foundations of mindfulness. And by relying on ourselves through this practice of mindfulness with breathing, on these four foundations of mindfulness, then we have the duty that we can actually depend on. So thus, this, the highest thing that there is, the supreme thing, is, is duty, is Dhamma. The Buddha himself proclaimed that all Buddhas, all those who know, all the ones who know, honor duty. All Buddhas honor duty. The Buddha honored duty above all else. This duty is the highest thing, the supreme thing. It's that through which we quench all dukkha and are saved. This is the thing most worthy of our attention, the thing we must know and do and have and use. Duty, the, the supreme thing. Through practicing anapanasati, you can know what you need to know and you'll have the ability to do the duty that you need to do. So by learning to practice anapanasati, you can fulfill your duty and thereby be saved from all suffering. So for this reason, we're, we welcome you all to come here and to, to study and learn how to practice anapanasati. We're trying to do our best to aid you in that, to give you what support and knowledge we can so that you can be successful in it. We don't know how many times it will take, how, many, how long you'll have to stay or how many times you'll have to come back until you're able to get it right. But we're, we're willing to help in any way we can. So we'd like to express our, our appreciation and joy in, that you've come here in order to learn about anapanasati, this system of mental cultivation that will allow you to, to do this duty, to realize the supreme thing. We hope, you, we wish you the greatest success in this de endeavor, and we hope that it doesn't take you too long. And this is the end of today's talk. <laughs>